great. So hi, everyone. So moving now to second panel, redesigning the economic model. Uh, in this panel, we'll elaborate on how to redesign the existing economic model. So topics such as the eight principles of regenerative econo economy, uh, reductionism versus all is, and how to see and understand human economy as a living system, uh, how we can apply the living systems principles to modern economics, business, uh, and finance will be discussed. So we have John Fulton online, whom I, I thank once again for, for, for being with us, and also Nuno Oliveira. Uh, yes, please join us, Nuno. Nuno is a, an expert in biodiversity and ecosystems, and is the CEO and co-founder of Natural Business Intelligence. So let's start with the presentation by John, and then open the discussion uh, to Nuno and to our guests. John, the stage is yours. I'm just going to get started. I hope this works. Um, Gunter, always a pleasure to see you again. And um, uh, great to be with you all in Portugal. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Uh, there's a, <laughs> that was my responding to Gunter's question 20 seconds ago. Um, but uh, we'll do our best. I think the best I can do is just to go quickly through a talk the, the feedback is, is not good, um, but let me just go through a, a prepared slide deck that I have. Is that showing? Excellent. So um, I, I began this journey toward regenerative economics actually through a project that I worked on on the grasslands with Alan Savory. So uh, similar to many of Gunter's projects, I learned this through experiential uh, learning, not through academics. And, um, and it had a profound impact on me. And the basic idea I had was that if holistic planned grazing can work on the system called the grasslands, why couldn't it also work on the system we call our economy? So that is the, the, the background on how I got involved in this idea um, of regenerative economics. Now, I think we all know now we're stuck in a, in a very difficult place. Uh, Thomas Berry, who is one of my uh, major influences, says it beautifully, that we're in trouble because we no longer have a good story. We're in between stories, and the old story is no longer functioning, and we're searching for a new story. The heart of our challenge is that we've become very good at what's complicated over the course of the scientific revolution and the modern age, but we don't understand what's complex. And there's a difference between complexity and what's complicated. Living systems are complex. Our human bodies, our families, our nation states, and our companies, and the human economy is complex, but we're very good at what's complicated. Our reductionist thinking helps us solve complicated problems, but it gets us under, into real trouble when we're trying to deal with complexity, like the complexity of Earth's living systems. So I believe we're not just dealing with a cascading set of challenges, we're actually at the dawn of a new age, an age that I'll call the regenerative era, that will follow the modern era, and and I just got a text. I don't know if I should just keep going or not. Sorry about this. Yeah, keep going. Keep. keep going. Okay. Yeah, keep going. Um, so we're, we're in this new period where we need to learn a new way of thinking 
a thinking that's appropriate for uh, not this uh, reductionist mindset, but a, a, um, a, a way of seeing holes. And we're in the challenge of having to not only solve problems, which is this outer ring, but also uh, transform the system that is generating the problems that we're responding to. And to do that, we're going to need to shift our level of consciousness. This is uh, a, a framework that Monica Sharma has presented. Monica Sharma is known for uh, having solved the AIDS crisis in Africa. And our challenge is we need to continue doing the problem solving, but we need to create a new economic system at the same time that is sourced from a higher level of consciousness. And the ethics that Gunter talked about is certainly a piece of that. We also need a new uh, theoretical framework for an economy. And as much as we all want to get busy solving, putting out the fires, if we keep using our old economic frameworks, reductionist logic, Newtonian logic to fight the fires, we create new fires without intending to. The essence of this is what Kenneth Bowling said over 50 years ago, which is that in economics, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. In 2015, I did my first paper on this, and I'd like to share a definition. Regenerative economics is the application of nature's laws and patterns of systemic health, self-organization, self-renewal, and regenerative vitality to socioeconomic systems. It understands that the human economy is embedded in human civilization, which in turn is embedded in the biosphere. Nature is not separate from the human economy. Regenerative economics is not just a new name for sustainability, it's not a political philosophy, and it's not just an agricultural or environmental idea alone. I would assert three premises for a regenerative economy. First is that firms and indeed the entire economy are living systems. Second, there are patterns and principles that describe how all living systems that have sustained themselves in the real world work. And third, if our human economy is to be sustainable, if it is to thrive and be healthy and whole over the long run, its system design must align with these same patterns and principles. And the, the visual, the Bill Reed map that you saw earlier is a, is a beautiful way of showing this. It's important to understand that the regenerative process over on the right is the only thing that, would en that enables living systems to be sustainable and to thrive over the long run. So we need to shift to the regenerative process and sustainability will be the outcome of that. It's not a linear check across the screen. I've tried to describe in reducing to eight principles the essence of how a regenerative economy needs to work, the core principles that we must align with. Um, given the feedback and everything, I don't think I should try to uh, walk through these today. Um, uh, but there's plenty of information on our website. I invite you to come uh, read as much as you can. But the key idea here is that living systems behave in accordance with these same patterns and principles, regardless of what they are, from our human body to the biosphere itself. And if we use this as a compass to guide our actions, our urgent short-term actions, rather than the old compass, which is reductionist logic, Newtonian-based economics, we will get to the outcome we actually deserve. In terms of how to apply this inside a corporation, most of the work we're doing in the sustainability field is focused around products and services, and then secondly, business models. That's a critical, vital work. But until we bring this um, living systems framework to the inside of the company, to the culture, to the leadership, and to the purpose of the corporation, and then apply it all the way through governance, capital structure, and business model, we will fail to get to a regenerative economy. I'd like to invite you all to join an eight-week course we've launched. I'm particularly proud of the feedback from the senior executives at Patagonia. 
he described the course and said it honestly blew our doors off. I will never see the world or my role in it the same way again. We need to see the world in a new way. That is the essence of this transformation from the modern age to what I'm calling the regenerative age. And in sum, this is nothing new. In fact, this thinking goes back to indigenous times, of course. It goes back to the Western mystics and the, um, uh, some of the, in particular, the, the alchemists. But more recently, I was stunned to read in Bucky Fuller's final book called Grunch, his critique of capitalism. He wrote at the end, nature is a totally efficient, self-regenerating system. If we discover the laws that govern this system and live synergistically within them, sustainability will follow and humankind will be a success. And what this doesn't say, but what was clear from reading his book, is that if we don't do this, if we don't align our economy with the patterns and principles of living systems, humankind will not be a success. Thank you, and again, I apologize for the feedback and difficulty. Thank you very much, John. Um, I will pass the, the floor now to, to Nuno to provide us with some thoughts regarding what you have presented. Just some thoughts after, after Fullerton, nothing special. Um, uh, first of all, it's, how can I say, it's a privilege to be alive now. See, this sounds like a, a cliche, a commonplace, but it's a privilege to be alive in a moment when we have enough notion what what we've done and we are aware of what we can do. This is like a turning point in the history of mankind. For the, maybe for the first time in centuries, we are aware of the ability to bring back nature, and by bringing back nature, seeing that as an extremely positive action. Because in fact, when we try to define the, the, even the word economy, if you look at the word economy, economy is not, uh, not easy to define. I've tried many definitions from many thinkers and, and, and many, many academicians. And I come to this definition that simply says economy is the way we measure progress. Not growth, progress. And growth is in fact part of progress, but not all progress is growth. So what is progress? Now let's look back at nature. Let's see how nature evolved from the first cells, from the first events, from the cataclysms, from the transformation. And what, can, what we can see is that time, over time, over time, nature restores. Nature regenerates itself. Nature creates value, adds value. Now imagine that you have a business or you're running a government that whatever you do, the process is so lean, is so well thought, is so intelligent that it creates value even when you're sleeping. That's the trick of it. That's the trick of rethinking economy. How we can look at economy and, and, and defeat Sauron and the one ring for once and, all, uh, and for all. We're talking about the GDP. It's one GDP to rule them all. It's like we have only one measure and we define economy by a growth equation that was very useful. It was very interesting because there was this certain Monday back in 29 in the States that the world went worry. And this guy really invented this equation, very practical, very simple, to restore part, part of the economy. And this guy, Simon uh, Kuznets, Kuznets was his name, I guess so, he went to the Congress, to the American Congress, and said, by no means, this should be used to measure progress, to measure human well-being. Back in 1930, and uh, almost 100 years later, we still open the, 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 the news or the journal and says the economy grew by 2% or the economy is decaying by 1%. And he said, no, are we really talking about progress, well-being? Are we talking about nature? And we're not. So we need to redefine this conversation. And when we start, when we start talking about regeneration, the word is generation. Re is just us needing to uh, to survive, because nature provides us with all we need. We call it ecosystem services. I guess as a biology, that was a disservice that we did to you, because ecosystem services seems like. Uh, something very technical. Certainly, you need at least three PhDs to understand what ecosystem services. No, it's talking about what nature provides us. 
and when we're talking about what nature provides us, we have the, 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 the products that we need, we have the, 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 the food, the fiber, the, the water, the fuel, we have all the construction materials, the, 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 the pharmaceutical drugs, we have all this, but then we have the services, we have the software, regulating carbon, purifying water, and restoring, enhancing how habitats work and bring those back to, to, to us, bring those savers back to us. And then you have a third part of services called the cultural services. Nature doesn't care about cultural services, we do. Nature just creates, nature exists, and we either contemplate or we feel marvel or not, or we feel dismay or not. So it's very important that we are at the center of the theory of ecosystem services. And when you think about how we have decoupled economy from ecology, sometimes I feel that economy and ecology are like, you know, two sisters that really went well with one another, and then suddenly some Christmas they went to, <laughs> they disagreed, and I said, I'm not going to talk back to you, not in 10 years, and then they went each other the other way. Sometimes you see each other in the street, or when somebody dies, or something like that, oh, the, oh ecology, are you okay? Hey, I'm economy, I'm fine. But then you come to this point, when I said, and just for conclusion, what a time to be alive. We are aware of what economy is, we are aware of what ecology is, but man, if we combine the both, this is it. Thank you, Nuno, for your words. Um, from the, the, the regenerative economics course I had uh, the pleasure to attend, offered by Capital Institute, uh, I extracted two, two ideas from the many others, fantastic ideas that was, were provided by John and, and his team. One was regeneration is the living system process that delivers sustainable well-being as the outcome. And another one, who is very linked to me because I'm a professor of sustainable finance, is finance must be put in the service to life. And I like uh, that John and even, uh, <coughs> sorry, and you, Gunter, uh, to elaborate a little bit more on this, please. Let's start with John. John, are you listening? No, Gunga, perhaps. Please start. It's very important we contemplate just for one minute the incredible stupidity of an economic system we have today. Whatever is good for you and whatever is good for the environment is expensive. Whatever is bad for you and destroys the environment is cheap. And the rule of the economy is we compete on being the cheapest. I don't get it. Who invented that? I mean, come on, let's put him in jail at least for a night. Because it's not possible to have an economy where the good is expensive and the bad is cheap. Now that's what we've created. And we've created an economy where we say we can't extract ourselves because we don't seem to understand how an ecosystem regenerative economy works. In a regenerative economy, you start with nothing. It means nothing, just with some single cells and maybe even a desert. But you end up with abundance. This is amazing. Ecosystems have this incredible capacity to continuously invent more diversity, more niches, more opportunities. It is the hotbed of entrepreneurship for the common good. So what we need is we need to change the core of our competitive model that cannot be, be the cheapest but it has to be generate the most value, value in financial and non-financial terms. The value of a family is the love in the family, God damn it! it's not the money that's in the account. And we need to have at the core this clarity that we have to have the generation of value and the generation of value that leads to resilience because in an 
ecosystem that is regenerative, we're never only looking at the growth. At a certain moment, the tree says, I reached 80 meters, this is it. And now I created the canopy, and now more can be generated underneath of me. Do we realize that a tropical rainforest generates per year, per hectare, 500 tons of biomass? We cut it to plant GMO soy that we claim is the most productive in generating protein. I don't know. I mean, you can fool statistics, you can fool people, but they really fooled us all the way. And we believe this. I mean, this is the problem. We even believe it. So the core is can we have value at the center of this regenerative system whereby both the financial and the non-financial play a key role um, so that we can, as in nature, also happens cooperation and competition, we can compete for making the most value out of what is ever here available. And whatever failed in generating more value today is a fossil. Thank you. For example, uh, there's a lot of waste in Portugal uh, from the garbage that we make in the houses and that it could uh, made in compost. And I'm asking everybody here in this conference to try to do something about it because I really hate to uh, throw my waste into the gray contender that it's not uh, going to be uh, renewed. So I invented a system that it's like um, making vases, you know, vases, vases, out of cardboard, where you can automatically make the compost with soil, and then you can make a tree on it. So with the, the process of uh, reforesting could be faster. We can take this to the city halls. The city halls can ta -ta -ta -ta, move with schools. I don't know, I'm a bit nervous. Sorry, guys. <laughs> there is no need to be nervous at all. But you see, your question raises a very important reflection. What is the hot topic today? It's energy and gas, right? Mm -hmm. Have you heard about any discussion about <laughs> energy and gas lately? Yeah. So my question is immediately, what can we do in a city in order to increase gas production in the city? And so I'm saying compost is great, but gas made first will mean that we will have better compost. What do we do? And this has been done in seven Swedish cities. This is done in Busan. This we're doing in 11 Latin American cities. Every kitchen is cutting fine all the organic waste of the home. Goes into the water. The water system goes through a wastewater treatment. And we turn the wastewater treatment into a gas production system. Methane is produced. If you have a wastewater system that is pushing air through the water so bacteria get in overdrive and eat all the organic waste, then you have a cost. If you're having a gas production, biogas production, methane production, then you need to have a very high BOD, very high organic charge, and that means that the 50% of the organic waste that you have will go through the sink into the system. Today we have 24 cities doing that in the world. Guess what happens? The city makes money on the wastewater treatment because the wastewater treatment generates gas. Why are we not doing this? Oh, because we have decided that there should be core business strategy. You should have companies doing water treatment and you should have companies doing gas. And those who do gas don't want anyone in the water treatment to be gas suppliers. So what do we do? We say, hell with you all, we're going to do it anyway. And this is why we need the rebels today who say, in my community, in my five houses, in our 25 houses, we will do this. And this is the only way to have a positive and immediate impact, is to say, hell with the rules that make it impossible to change. Hell with it. 
we're going to change it around. Why? Because we need gas. Simple as that. A house of a household of four people can generate all the biogas they need to generate solely from their own organic waste. The kitchen waste is not enough. We need the other waste as well. But we will talk about that next time. Thank you.